Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to another episode of Kryptonites. And before we hit season three, we're here to show you some of the best moments with some incredible speakers that paved the way for everyone in season one. So get ready for the highlights and best moments, a blast from the past right now. So Clarice, there were so many timeless moments in season one. There were. Which speaker, which moments did you really remember and really made you think, wow? Well, there are quite a lot actually, Alex. Um, I think one of the, the ones that really marked me the most was Cyrus Fazel's interview uh, in season one, where he talks about entrepreneurship and how you have to have some sort of crazy in you. He actually uses the word ludicrous. You have to have a bit of ludicrous in you. He was saying how much he places stickers in the apartment and even in the, the headquarters, in the office, there are lots of stickers. And that's, uh, it's sort of like a trademark, it's imprinted. And I thought that was uh, really memorable. Yeah, having posters on the walls, stickers, all these reminders that really sink on a subconscious level is yeah. really important to exactly. create that ludicrous you know, feeling. Yeah. That's awesome. So. First up, we have Cyrus Fazel interview from season one. Let's check out the highlights together. If you have a multiple utility token, such as ours, our CHSB token, you know, you, each time you're bringing in a product and a service and you're, you're essentially growing the ecosystem, you have a token that could be used rather than staking it, rather than you know, paying it. So you, you'll have more and more value that goes to it which is really good, uh, you know, what you could, you could have as well as well in a share though. Again, it's not, that just the main difference again between the share and a utility token is that one is backed by, you know, a centralized government. The other one is based on the trust that you have with the network. And uh, well, you don't, not one or the other is better. It's just that it depends, you know, where you're putting your trust and if you really want to use that token within the ecosystem or just want to be a passive investor. And if you really want to be a strong believer in crypto, I think so you need to use crypto. You don't need to invest only in crypto, but actually you need to use it. You know, it's great to buy, have Bitcoin, you know, as a store of value. But the best thing to do is to actually to buy Bitcoin and start using it. If not, it's just going to be another investment, you know, uh, investment vehicle, which is good enough. But it's not the main thing. The main thing is to use the technology and not actually to just invest in it. So I'm obviously really biased, but Cyrus Fazel is actually my little brother and I was super proud of his performance. He didn't think he performed well, but it was just gem after gem after gem. Great stuff. Now, Clarice, moment number two. If you had to choose just one more out of the entire season one, which legend would you choose and what inspired you the most? The legend that inspired me the most would be Andreas Antonopoulos. Oh. <laughs> Especially the five pillars of blockchain technology. I think anyone who's interested in blockchain should read about it. He also speaks about the unbanked and he talks about how blockchain can solve those problems. Absolutely. That interview, I had goosebumps going up my spine. It was just like, whoa, the emotions. The five pillars should be in the Bible of blockchains if there is a Bible one day. It's a great part. So guys, check out the five pillars and how Andreas moved us during this awesome interview. So uh, the five pillars are basically a set of tools to understand whether what you're talking about is really one of the interesting um, systems that I call, I prefer to call open public blockchains to differentiate from the generic term that has become so insidious and meaningless, which is blockchain. Everybody does blockchain today and it doesn't mean anything. Um, so I talk about open blockchain, and to, to elaborate on, on that, um, to me a blockchain is powerful if it's open, public, neutral, borderless, and censorship resistant. Right? And what do those things mean? Um, open means that anyone can access it without um, permission, without vetting, without identity. They can participate in it just by downloading software. Nobody can put up barriers to access. Nobody gets to vet or authorize or give you an account. You don't need any of that. 
it's public. All of the information is available for everyone to validate and verify for themselves without appealing to another authority. You can build APIs on it. You can develop uh, new software that connects to it. You don't need permission to do any of that. You have full access to um, all of the capabilities of the system. Borderless, there are no borders. There were never borders, that's a fiction. The world is one place. We are on one boat that ca carries humanity through space. Right? And borders are fictional things that just divide us. On the internet, there are no borders. On cryptocurrency, there are no borders. It doesn't care where you're from, where you were born, where you are currently residing or passing through. Borderless is really important. No other system of money today, other than perhaps physical gold, is truly as borderless as digital cryptocurrency. Um, censorship resistant, right? Censorship resistant means that no matter what other people think, you can make a transaction. You can make a transaction and no one can stop you from making a transaction. If there are gatekeepers, if there are controls, if some people are allowed to make transactions, if some transactions are permitted and some are not, depending on what you're trying to buy or who you are or where you were born, then it's not censorship resistant. Now, that doesn't mean completely censorship proof. Censorship can occur, but it can occur for limited times and in limited places. You can't censor all of it all the time, just like the internet. Some of it will go down now and then um, for limited time, but you can't turn off all of the internet all of the time. Yeah. And finally, neutral. Neutral, just like internet neutrality. The internet routes packets, no matter where they come from, no matter where they're going, no matter what the content is inside, it doesn't care. Source, destination, and content are not relevant to the routing of the system. That applies to open public cryptocurrencies and blockchains like Bitcoin and like many others that copy the same model and have been inspired by Bitcoin. Neutral means it doesn't matter what source is sending a payment or participating in a smart contract or doing a transaction of any kind. It doesn't matter what the destination is. It doesn't matter what the value or content of that transaction is or what its purpose is or what it's buying. Completely neutral. Your payment will be routed. Those are the fundamental principles that make this a revolutionary, disruptive, empowering technology that can change our world. Anything less than that, it may be useful to some. It might even have an impact on some financial services an improvement of their incredibly centralized systems. To me, it's boring. It's irrelevant. It is like your corporate internet compared to the internet, the global network that we all participate in. Right? Your corporate internet, it's there. It's boring. Nobody cares. Right? And people are trying to build these permission blockchains that strip away all of the interesting capabilities. So you can pretend as if they're doing something novel, but it's really business as usual disguised with this new terminology. Um, and you know, you, you can play with that if you want to. For me, it's boring, but people need to have the tools to understand the difference between the two. All right, so we just went over Andrea Santanopoulos with some incredible moments, timeless moments. We also saw Cyrus Fazel, CEO of SwissBorg. And now I'm here with Liam, the director of Kryptonites, one of the geniuses behind the cameras. Buddy, season one was pretty crazy. What was your favorite bit? Um, I'd say Ryan Radloff is up there for sure. Specifically talking about how new cryptocurrencies coming on the market can't necessarily just expect to improve upon a single characteristic or aspect of Bitcoin like transaction speed, for example, and just expect to have the same kind of store of value as Bitcoin. Yeah, Ryan Redloff is a dude, huh? CEO of CoinShares. Check out another timeless interview, and here is a highlight from the interview with Ryan Radloff, CEO of CoinShares. I think it is a fallacy, it is a, a, an improper classification to call it a currency. You know, it, 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 that is a subcategory of what Bitcoin is. Uh, Bitcoin is much larger than that. In fact, it is, it's, we're unable to define what Bitcoin is. Uh, Bitcoin is an ideology. It's, it's literally an ideology. It isn't just a currency. Um, and when you have different platforms that are trying to compete with Bitcoin on one of its subcategories, I think ultimately it's a losing game. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have 
like newer cryptocurrencies that are trying to be just a medium of exchange uh, or forks of Bitcoin that are trying to just be medium of exchange but not the store of value are missing the bigger picture. You know, Bitcoin is an, is an extension, it's a little technical, but it's like an Austrian economics ideology that is 5,000 years old. It's the idea that money itself, not currency, but money should be hard to create, it should be difficult to produce, and it should be very difficult to replicate. Uh, and that goes against what the mainstream money is today. Um, now, whether it's easy to exchange or not, it is incredibly easy to exchange. The reason it's not being exchanged right now is because it's too volatile. Now, all the other exchange tokens that are backed by belief are also going to be just as volatile as Bitcoin. So that's why I think it's a fallacy that Bitcoin or any digital asset that is backed by belief, which is what they all should be backed by, uh, to truly be different than the legacy system, uh, has to be a medium of exchange first. Rather, what it has to be is it has to win the rights of being a store of value and a monetary unit that is separate from the legacy system first. Once it wins that war and that battle, then the easy part is the uh, exchangeability. I mean, this thing is divisible by 100 million. We can send it anywhere uh, now with Lightning Network instantly, and there'll be 50 other versions of Lightning Network that we probably can't even think of in the next 20 years. Uh, the easy fight is speed. The hard fight is winning the, the global belief structure that this is a monetary unit that exists wholly outside the legacy system and is incorruptible by the powers that exist on the other side of the fence. All right, so we had Andreas Antonopoulos, Ryan Radloff, CEO of CoinShares, Cyrus Fazel, CEO of Swiss Pork, and now I'm here with Philip, the creative genius behind the cameras. Buddy, season one, what's your favorite take? Again, I've got to bring him up one more time, Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, part two of his interview. Oh. Uh, probably my favorite part of season one, him talking about financial inclusion. Uh, he's a massive advocate for it and banking the unbanked and anytime that guy opens his mouth about blockchain It's just fascinating to listen to so my favorite part of season one for sure That talk with Andreas Antonopoulos was jaw-dropping I remember everyone was mesmerized in front of the stage and reminds us that really we're privileged and fortunate and lucky and Helps us see the other side of the thing. So without further ado, Andreas Antonopoulos part two best of highlights Fundamentally, it's about replacing the current layer of leaders with themselves. They don't want to change the system. They just want to put themselves at the top of the pyramid, right? So it's a, it's a very greed-driven and personal ambition and ego-driven uh, message. I think, especially among young people who have now realized that a lot of the financial system is rigged against their interests, Right? We have a generation now that has basically been ripped off by their elders and delivered a planet in chaos. And we're like, good luck with that. You know, um, my parents' generation, the statistics, if you look, it takes like 350 hours of minimum wage work in the 1960s in order to afford a four-year college education. And today, it takes 4,800 hours of minimum wage work to afford that. Right? And we saddle people with this debt and we're like, well, why aren't you working harder? Why aren't you buying homes and consuming so we can drive the economy? Why? Because our future was stolen. Millennials understand that the system as it is today, with its massive inequality, with its massive reliance on debt, um, is fundamentally broken. All right, there you go, guys. That was the best stuff from all the timeless interviews coming from season one of Kryptonites. But if we missed one of the interviews that you loved, don't forget to put it in the comments here below. In the meantime, I'm gonna leave you guys with one more clip from Tom Lee, Fun Strat, a guy who inspired me a lot because he is able to make us break our biases by not only thinking about different perspectives, but thinking about different perspectives from different generations. And the generational gap in timing the market really blew me away, great research. So here's the last clip and don't forget to tune in next week, eight o'clock GMT, premiering at a PC near you. Crypto is a highly hyper volatile asset. We've seen it, you know, four times it's fallen 90%. Every time previously it's recovered, which means crypto should be one to 2% of someone's portfolio, especially if they're treating it as an asset class. Demographics, explains markets better than almost anything else uh, in the world. In fact, I can tell you that if you just use demographics solely, you could predict stock market tops since 1870 
with a 40-year lead time, and you'd be right within one year every time. So what do I mean by that? Well, these are the six living generations in the United States. Greatest generation, silent generation, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. Most people in this room and most people who do crypto are millennials. On the right side, I list the year that the total population of each generation peaked. It's not the same as births because there's immigration, and it's not exactly 20 years apart because there's wars and everything. But take note of the dates, 1930, 74, 99, 2018. Well, see, um, take a look at this chart. This is the stock market since 1870. And I marked with columns the peak of every generation. It's called every major market top. So think about that. You could have predicted every major top, every major crash with a 40-year lead time, just using births. And interestingly, we published this last summer. 2018 was the peak of Generation X. Well, what happened in 2018? 97% of global stock markets around the world had the negative return, the worst since 1900. So last year, even though the US only fell 20%, it was essentially a global crash last year. Now here's what's good, the good news, if you guys own equities, if our analysis is correct, the next major bear market's not till 2038. So, you know, we're in a bull market for stocks for 20 more years.